many know that? How many know that God just doesn't meet us on Sundays? Come on, someone. But He's ready to meet us every day of the week like that to give us strength. And so, to all of our guests, first time guests, my name's Ken Central. I get the pastor one church. So glad you're here today. Glad you're a part of all of that. And um, and so I, I just want to take a, a couple of a couple of minutes today and. Uh, and I just really want to speak to, 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 to us, right, to, to us as one church. And, of course, anybody who's here, we want to, want to speak encouragement into your, your life. And that's really our goal is we want you to take that one step closer to Jesus today, whatever it might be, one step closer to encouragement. And so I, I want to talk to you uh, today um, just, about, just about empty chairs. And I, I, wanted you to talk, I want to talk to you about just the stories that go along with empty chairs, you know, because in every chair right now, obviously, if it's full, you're sitting in it or someone's sitting into it. Do you know everybody has a story? Every, you know, I've heard people say, I don't have a story. And sometimes they wind up having the best story. It's like, wow, your story could be a movie. And they're like, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, nothing's ever happened to me. Um, and yet every, everybody has a story. And so when we look around and we see empty chairs, there's, there's several empty chairs here this morning. Um, I'm wondering whose story has yet to be told. Whose story that God is moving in their life, bringing them to one church, and their story has yet to, been to, to be told because he's not fully moved in their life yet. And so I want to talk about the story of the empty chair. And so I, I want to first bring your attention back to Matthew chapter 28. And you guys don't, you guys don't have this verse um, and so Matthew 28, 19 and 20, uh, we're pretty familiar with this passage of scripture. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you even to the end of the age. And... Um, and actually, I'm going to uh, I'm going to throw the the tech booth for a for a for a trip here. In fact, you guys don't don't even put any of the points up. I think I'm just gonna see what happens. So, but do put up the verses, okay? And uh, so, and Luke, I want to read another passage of scripture to you. But before I do that, Jesus in Matthew 28:19, uh, this is called the what? The great what? the great commission, right? When you've been commissioned to do something, that means that you, you've been given an obligation, right? You've been given a, a charge to do something, right? Uh, and so here Jesus was saying, listen, this is what I want you to do. I'm about to go back to my Father in heaven, but I want you, everybody say me, right? Uh, to go and make disciples of all the nations. And, and he said, I want you to baptize them, right? And then verse 20, he said, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And so that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to share the gospel. And you know, it's easy to go to church and, and just say things like I just said. Hey, Jesus wants us to share the gospel. And so, you know, you could be here today going, okay, great. What's the gospel? You know, what is the gospel? And the gospel is, is it's basically the short story, right, of, of, of Jesus's life, his, his death for us on the cross, and his resurrection. That, that's the gospel of Christ. It's also called the good news, right? Um, now, the gospels, plural, uh, with an S, that's, that's the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when someone says the gospel, they're talking about the death, the burial, and the erection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news, the hope that we all have in Christ. When someone talks about the Gospels, they're talking about um, the books of the, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all tell about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, right? And so, so Jesus is saying, I want you to share the Gospel, uh, tell them about my life, tell them about how I went to the cross, uh, tell them about how I was resurrected again, how I defeated death, hell, and the grave, how I ascended back up into heaven. And so he said, I want you to, to, to do that, and I want you to teach all these new disciples who are going to follow me, tell them what I've commanded them in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and of course, the rest of the Scripture. So to do this, how many know that it takes intentionality to do this, right? It takes intentionality. So we're, I know we still have some students in the house. In fact, I've seen some students home from college. I've already seen a couple of you guys. And so glad, glad you're here, home on spring break. I think we're going to get a few more. So great to have you back at OC. But, uh, and I know a lot of students are here, there, and everywhere. But, but if you're going to be a great student, does it just happen by accident? Come on, all you parents. No, it does not, right? So what does it take to be a great student? Study, being diligent, what? 
<laughs> yes, that's, actually, that's, that's top of the list. If you want to be a good student, you've got to go to school. <laughs> That was worth the price of a mission. Some of you students have been going, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You're not going to school. <laughs> so you got to go to school. You got to be diligent. You got to study, right? You got you to do all those things. You've got to have intentionality to be a good student. Now, if you're going to be somebody who fulfills the, the great commission that Jesus has given us, it's going to take intentionality. It's going to take focus. No, nobody accidentally shares the gospel. Unless you're drunk at a bar, then, it, then who knows? It, it, it could happen. I've, I've heard of it happen. But usually, it takes great intentionality, presence of mind, and focus, right? No, and here's one thing I do know. Nobody accidentally just disciples another person so they, they can become more like Jesus. That takes great intentionality and focus. Can I get an amen out there? All right, all right. So Luke chapter 5, verse 18 and 26. I want to talk to you and give you kind of a picture of intentionality, the kind of intentionality it takes to fulfill the Great Commission, right? Because one church, this is why we exist. This is why, this is why God called this church into creation, right? Right? It's to change the world one person at a time. Our world is what? Our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors. It's our acquaintances. It's people in our world, right? And we want to change them. And it happens through relationships one at a time. So that's why God called us, right? And so, so we know that, that he's called us to do that, right? To help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference with their lives, right? So that's why we're here. So, so what kind of intentionality? Let me show you what kind of intentionality it takes to do that. Again, here's Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 18, right? So he, he's, uh, Jesus is teaching. Now, this is not a parable. This is an actual event, right? So some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, verse 19. They couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and they took off some tiles and then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Would not you have loved to have been there to see that? I always wonder, what was the homeowner thinking? <laughs> I just put that roof on. So they, so they make a hole in the roof, right? They lowered him down right in front of Jesus. I love this. Watch this, verse 20. Seeing their faith. Did you know our faith could be seen? Right? So why is that? Because faith, we demonstrate it, right? Through our actions and our behavior. So verse 20, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the young man, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. They just didn't know who was in the house, y'all. Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Watch this. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or Stand up and walk. In other words, he's saying, you do it. Yeah, right. uh, is it which one is easier? Mm -hmm. Verse 24, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, went home praising God, Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Amen. Would that not have been awesome to see? And, and then don't you know, everybody was talking about that, and, and it was going on everywhere. And, and so what I want you to understand is that these men who brought this paralyzed young man, they exhibited the focus and the intentionality that is needed to bring someone to Jesus. And, and so when, when we see all of that, we, many times we think about, man, it, I, I, I really wish they would come to Jesus. And, and, and I think about that, that young man laying paralyzed on a mat, don't know his backstory, but, but somebody knew his story. And there were at least two men, maybe four, 
We don't know how many men were carrying him, if there were two on each end, or if there were, there were four total, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that as they were, they were carrying him uh, to see Jesus. And so the thing is, it just didn't happen, right? They, they just didn't, they, you know, I mean, they're like, you know, it took some intentionality and some focus. And so to bring people to Jesus, the very first thing I want you to understand is, is we must see the needs of others. We have to see the needs of others. And these men saw these young men, this young man laying paralyzed on a mat. And so that registered, this guy has a need. And so I, I just want you to know as well, me individually and, and you individually and us collectively as one church, if we're going to obey Jesus and if we're going to fulfill the great commission, then we must learn to see the needs of other people. Why, why is that so important to see the needs of other people? Because when you see someone in need, there is a very very good possibility that they are open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they have a need in, your, in, in their life. Okay, when you have a need in your life, are you open to something? Are you open to hope? Are you open to an answer? Are you open to some good news? Come on, someone. The more I hear from you, the shorter the sermon is. And so when you have a need, what are you doing? You're searching. You're looking, where's the open door? Where's the help going to come from? And so when we see the needs of people, there's a great possibility that they're very open in that moment to hear about Jesus and, and to hear the gospel and the good news. And so when someone's hurting, when someone's confused, when someone is in pain, when someone is sick, when someone is discouraged, depressed, when someone is friendless, they are in a, trans, uh, in a transition moment where they could be open to the, to the hand of God moving uh, in their life. And listen, there are many people right now in your world who are open to the message of Jesus right now. No, not in your friend's world, not, not in, your, in, in, in somebody, but in your world right now. And many times we're saying, well, I, I, I know in that 1040 window and I, I, I know like probably in Egypt somewhere or somebody, but I'm, t I'm t right now, I want you to understand that the United States of America is a, is a postmodern nation now. What does that mean? That means that we're different than we were 20 years ago, 30 years ago. How people view Jesus, how, how people view God, they're very open about spirituality, but they don't know a lot about Jesus. And, and if you don't believe that, go, go, go talk to somebody about Jesus. There's a lot of far out funky ideas that are out there. And so people are very open and, and we're, we're living in a different age. And so people are open right now in your personal world to the message of hope that comes from Jesus. L look at what Jesus said. In John chapter four, verse 34, Jesus said, you know the sayings, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people, check that out, brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. So in Judea and Galilee, the gap between sowing Wheat and reaping the wheat was normally about four to five months. And that's what Jesus said. You know the saying, right? It, it, the four months between planting and, and harvest. But then look what he says. This is Jesus talking. But I say what? What did he say? But I say what? Wake up. Wake up. Everybody say that. Wake up. So the opposite of waking up is what? It's what some of y'all just did this morning. <laughs> That's what some of y'all watching online, you're like, I forgot it was that weekend. And so it's easy. Come on, it's easy, right, to slumber. It's easy to sleep. It's easy to go on cruise control in your life. Can I get an amen there? And so the, the fact of the matter is, Jesus said, hey, wake up. You know, you, you know the saying, four months, right, between planting and harvest. And then he said, but listen, the fields are already ripe. And so here, what Jesus is talking about, he's saying, listen, this isn't a norm, normal harvest. The harvest is right now. You don't have to wait. There's people in your world, in your life right now that are open to the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to talk about the harvesters. Who's the harvesters? Everybody lift your hand. That's us. We are the harvesters, right? There's the planters and then there's harvesters, right? And so Jesus said the harvesters who are followers of Jesus, they are paid well. What does that mean? That means you're paid well in this life and in the life to come when you, when you plant the gospel and when you harvest those who've come to have faith in Jesus through the gospel, right? And so, and so he said the result for the harvesters is joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Now you got to say it like the, like the dream team says it in our huddle in the morning, right? 
you got to choose what? Joy. That, that's more like it. And so here, the payoff, listen, the payoff of sharing the good news is joy. It's this radical joy that comes over you when you see someone's life change for the better. So you have to, first of all, see the need because that indicates many times that, that people are open. And, and many times people may not even have a need and they're still open. You know, they're open to a conversation. They're open to, to, to just connecting, hanging out, whatever the case might be to some point where you can, you can share about who Jesus is in your life. But the reality is what Jesus says is that there is a soul harvest right now, that there, we don't have to wait until a particular time because it's, it's taking place right now. So the first thing we have to do is to, to bring people to Jesus is we have to see the need so that we can speak into someone's life in a timely manner. But here's the second thing I want to bring to you is this. If we're going to bring people to Jesus, we cannot allow setbacks to discourage us. Right. Have you ever made up your mind that you're, you're going you're gonna to win someone to Jesus, right? And it doesn't happen. And like you've talked to them like five times, 10 times. And like, yeah, yeah, they, I, they, it, it's just not going to happen. First of all, I want you to understand something. You never win anyone to Jesus. I never win anyone to Jesus. Who does that? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But, but we are responsible to be the, the hands of Jesus, the, the mouthpiece of Jesus, the eyes, the ears, the feet of Jesus, right? And so our calling, our calling is to, to, is to put the seed in the ground, which is the gospel, put that in someone's heart, put that in someone's mind. Here's some good news. Think about this for a little while. Here's some hope. Think about that for a little while. And then, and then to help lead them to the Lord. But it's the Holy Spirit that, that puts that, that compulsion to turn their lives over to Jesus. But, but here, I want you to look and, and, and look again at verse 19. Um, when the guys were, were bringing this, this paralyzed young man to Jesus, verse 19, it says, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So th these guys that were bringing the paralyzed young man to Jesus, they were in the right place at the right time. They couldn't get to Jesus. There was a logistical problem. There was a crowd. They could not get to him because of everyone stacked up around Jesus. Everybody was in the house. People were in the yard. They, 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 they just, they couldn't get in there. So, so they just, they, they just, they went extra, right? They, they, they went up on the roof, took off the tiles. They lowered the sick man down right in front of Jesus. Now, I, when I read this, I think about this right here, you guys. Um, the men carrying this paralyzed young man, they could have said, oh, well, shucks, we tried. I mean, we tried. I mean, we should, get, we should get commended for our effort. We tried. Woo, the pressure is off. And, and they could have just turned around because they had an out if they wanted one. They could have turned around and taken that young man back to where they got him from, put him back down on the ground and left him there and he would have stayed in that condition the rest of his life. Do you guys see the parallel? Because many times we can say, well, you know, I, 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 uh, I invited him to church and so... I did everything I could do, Jesus. And so the point simply is, what compelled those men to take that young man to Jesus? What compelled them? They knew Jesus was the answer. And that's the difference. When you know Jesus is the answer, it compels you to bring people to Jesus. Because when, when, when you know Jesus is the only answer, really, that answers all the questions and all the longing and all the issues that people have in their life, then what happens is you develop an unwavering conviction that everyone needs Jesus and you're going to keep at it until that person comes to the Lord, right? Or until they reject God or whatever the point is, but you're going to do what the Lord has called you to do. Why? Because you know in your mind that Jesus is the only answer and Jesus is exactly what people need in this world today. And so when you know that he's the only answer, you develop a sense of confidence when talking talking about him to other people. And so the Bible calls this confidence faith, right? And so when you start getting faith in your heart and in your spirit that Jesus is the only answer, then it doesn't matter if, if they don't respond in that moment. It doesn't matter if, if no many times, how, how many times you share the gospel or you speak life or you smile and they gripe back or whatever the case might be, uh, you, you just keep putting it out there. Because I wonder how many people have been saved over the years because they had a family member or they had a coworker or they had a friend who had enough faith to keep talking to them about Jesus. And I'll tell you how many people have been one like that. Millions upon millions upon millions of people. So you have to see the need, right? And then don't get discouraged when they don't immediately say, I've been waiting for you all my life. And they fall to their knees in the school cafeteria and they pray to the Lord and the light shines down. I mean, don't get discouraged if that doesn't happen. 
Can it happen? It absolutely can. Usually doesn't. Sometimes one plants and another one comes along and they harvest. And we just may be a chain. But here's the thing. We can't hand off our responsibility in the process of the harvest to somebody else. Right? We have to speak it. We got to share it. We can't get discouraged by that. All right? And, and even though there may not be any outward interest, there may not seem to be any outward change or, or anything of that nature in that person you're, 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 you're talking to, just keep on gently. Now, when I say sharing the gospel, when I talk about, you know, doing all these things, I, I'm not talking about coming across hard. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, hey, you need Jesus. You're going to turn or you're going to burn because I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I hear the trumpet sounding. I heard, <laughs> I heard them practicing in heaven. And hell is hot. <laughs> Where are you going to spend eternity, smoking or non-smoking? Where, what's it going to be? And so, so the reality is that's not what I'm talking about. Of course, it's not what I'm talking about. The point is to be sensitive. It's to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and see the need. And, 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 you know, maybe the person's outgoing so you can really engage them. Or maybe they're quiet so you engage them that way. And, 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 and sometimes it, it's, not even, it's not even a spiritual conversation, but it is a conversation. Yeah. It's just sometimes it's a smile. Hey, how's it going? And you just start building a connection, a friendship. Hey, hey, hey we're going to go grab a bite. You want to come with us? You know what I'm talking about. So it's just meeting people where they're at. And when, that, when, when it happens and you're ready to, to share the good news, the hope, and, and sometimes it's bit by bit. Uh, sometimes it's the elevator speech where you give it all quickly because you may never see that person again and God's opened the door. Who knows? So it's just, it's just saying, hey, I'm going to be prepared. And, and you know what? There's no such thing as expert status. You just, you just do it. You, you just do it. Have you ever said something to somebody about the Lord and you walk away going, oh my, I, what did I even say? Do y'all, has that ever happened to you? Where you felt like, hey, I need, to, I need to share this. And you walk away and you're like, huh, they probably think I've lost my mind. But then later you found out how, how profound that was to that individual and how much they needed that in the moment. Because we put a great outward facade over ourselves. And inside, we can be a completely different opposite picture of what our exterior looks like. Inside, we can be broken. Inside, we're looking, is anybody, does anybody care today? Is anybody going to speak to me? Is anybody going to smile at me? Is anybody going to see my need today? So see the need and don't get worried when obstacles come. Just keep loving people. Keep connecting with people, right? And then, then here's the third point I want to bring out to you. To bring people to Jesus, we must take strategic action. Everybody say strate- strategic <laughs> say it not like how I did, but <laughs> how you should say it. Strategic. So strategic means, you know, actually having a, a thought out plan, right? Sometimes we go with the flow. Sometimes it's like spirit led and all those things, right? But when I think about these men bringing this young man to Jesus, they, they put thought and they put effort into bringing this young man to him. Uh, first of all, they had to know where Jesus was, which it, that wasn't uh, an easy thing to do. Sometimes Jesus was here. Sometimes he was over there. He was in different places, different towns teaching. So number one, they had to know where G- Jesus was. Then they, if it was one guy, he had to round up a couple of more guys and say, listen, uh, this young man, he needs to go find Jesus. So, so come with me. So, so, so there was a, there was a team building right there. Uh, they had to actually, it it took physical energy to carry this young man to where he was. Uh, they, they actually got there. They couldn't get in. So they weren't discouraged. Right. Uh, they knew they were in the right vicinity. So they, they, they weren't overwhelmed with that. They kept taking action. And so they had to find a ladder. Come on, somebody, you just, I mean, many times in, in scripture, we think, well, uh, it just that, I mean, they levitated up, you know, to the, they did it. They're, they're just like you and I. So they had to find a ladder. Uh, then they had to haul that boy up, you know, and, and that, that took a lot. And then they had to, they had to find some rope. They had to find some kind of a tool to open up the roof. Right. And, and then they had to, it took teamwork to, to lower the man right down. And yet, so it took great intentionality. It took some, some strategy into doing all of that, but, but don't overlook the fact that they did not over strategize. In other words, they, they, they had a brief plan and they went for it instead of thinking about it and then praying it to death. Jesus has gone to the cross. He has put in the tomb for three days. He was raised back to life. He appeared to many. He sent it back up into heaven. Holy Spirit's been poured out. 
The Great Commission's been given. The Holy Spirit is available, walking with everybody who would ever share the gospel. And here we are many times. Father, if it be your will, should I speak to my coworker today? Give me a sign. Should I? If it's raining outside, I, I know that's a no. I, I'm, I'm confused and I want to know your will. Let me know your will. Oh God, my heart is consumed with the things that move your heart. Show me, uh, should, I, should I talk to her uh, today? Should I or, or, or just uh, not? That was just a tiny extra. Because so many times we can be asleep. And Jesus said, wake up. Because the harvest is now. The harvest is now. The harvest is in the cubicle next to you. The harvest is in the, is in the bus seat right behind you. The harvest is maybe in, in your van pool. Actually, we don't do that anymore, right? People work at home. Um, so the reality is, is that it's here and it's now. And the only thing that's keeping that from happening is reluctance, our fear, our worry about what someone would think about us. Guys, this is straight one church. This is, this, this is what we do, right? This is why we're here. And so the reality is we have to take strategic action, but it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be over the top. Just have a bit of a plan and then just do it. Just, just do what teenage boys say all the time. Watch this. And, and we shouldn't, right? I mean, it's like, I remember jumping ramps and doing things. And I, I, got, I got tickled because at the, at the man camp, um, th there were some guys. I mean, we had a little bit of down, downtime. I saw someone picking up big, big logs, throwing it, you know, uh, towards other. It's just things that guys do, right? And, and, and I, I don't know why we do those things, but, but it's like, hey, will this hurt, you know? Uh, <laughs> But, but it's, kind of, it's really funny. I, I think it's kind of funny. You know, but the thing is, it's just like, it's just, like just, just do it. Say that. Just do it. Just say it. You know, just, just walk across the office, walk across the, uh, the workplace, you know, connect with somebody, uh, start, uh, you know, speaking to them. Uh, and, and then a lot of it, too, it's like, how do you walk into work? How do you walk into work? How do you carry yourself? What's your persona? Are you a child of God or are you just barely there? right? I mean, are you like, you like, like, it's another freaking Monday and I hate, I hate this place, right? <laughs> are you walking in with purpose, distinction, and knowing God is with you and you're on a mission, yeah. right? Because you know your job is not about the job. It's about the people who are there. Right. And God gave you the job to provide for your needs, but also to, to, to reach the people that are there uh, in, in, in your world, right? So take strategic action. So we talk about that and we talk about a simple plan, right? That, that can help get this moving in your life. And so first of all, we say create an Oikos map and, and Oikos just, it just simply stands for influence, right? And, and so we're talking about you and we're talking about your life. So to, so to build an Oikos map and actually on Monday, I'm going to send a link out to all of this stuff I'm talking about. So if we don't have your contact information and you want it, just go to guest services and, uh, and, and fill out that contact card and we'll put you in on that list. But an Oikos map is basically, it's a map of people who don't know Jesus in your life. And so anybody ever drawn like a mind map at, at, at school or at work or something? So just so start with a circle, a small circle in the middle um, of, your, uh, of the page and put your name in it and then start drawing a little line, draw another little circle, put the name of another friend who doesn't know Jesus in your life. And then from, from your name, draw another little line and another little circle, put another friend because ha ha listen, think about this right now. How many know at least three people who don't know Jesus in your life right now, in your world? They, they don't know Jesus or they're far from Jesus. They knew him at one time, they've drifted, right? So the point simply is make a mind map and then think about that person's life. So if, if you have a, a, a friend at, at, at work whose name is Leroy, and you know, he's, he's far from Jesus, uh, so write his name in there, and then write another little line in a little circle, and think about Leroy's life, and say, you know what, he has a wife, Leona, and, and you know, she's far from God too. And then, but then also too, they have two kids, write their names down. And, and so you do that, and, and just go until you can't do it anymore, and then start praying over that map. What are we talking about? A strategy. 
Start praying over that mat. Father, give me an opportunity. Instead of, should I? Start praying, Father, open the door for me. And I will tell you, as sure as I'm standing here, I've never said anything truer. If you pray for an opportunity to share the gospel with an unchurched or a person who's far from the Lord, you will get that opportunity. Why? Because it matters to the Father. He's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. Come on, somebody. So pray for that. That's an Oikos map. Well, well, I'll send the link. You, you, know, you can f- figure out how to do all of that. And so pray for open hearts. Pray for open minds. We talk about how to do like a, like a, like a quick uh, a testimony, right? Two-minute testimony. Uh, and so whenever you have that opportunity, just open your mouth and start talking. And sometimes it's not even, again, it's not about spiritual things. It's just about life. And maybe you're connecting. Maybe it's lunch. Maybe whatever. So just, just start and begin somewhere, right? And I want you to notice that that Jesus made the man right with God, then he healed him. That, that's the process. So he looked, he saw that the men lowered him, said, young man, your sins are forgiven. That's when the Pharisees got all bent, and that's a whole other subject we don't have time to go into. And then he said, just so you know, I have the authority to forgive sins, get up, walk, go home. And he did that. How awesome it must have been for those men to know that they had played a role in that young man's life getting changed. What joy. And it's the same kind of joy you feel when you're able to connect someone to Jesus. That joy is so awesome and it's so wonderful and it's so amazing. And so he first forgave the young man's sins, then he healed him. And so the most important thing that we can do as a church, as individual uh, followers of Jesus, is to help position people that through the Holy Spirit, they can be made right with Jesus. And then he begins to heal their lives, right? Begins to put their lives back together. And I want you to understand that there was no room for this man in the house because other people were taking up the room. And I just want you to know at one church, we intentionally make room in this house. Every Sunday, there are some open chairs. We're doing that intentionally. Everybody needs to visualize they're one, right? They're one person that they're they're, they're trying to win to the Lord, right? And it's okay to have several ones to be working them simultaneously, right? They need to visualize their one sitting in church, sitting in what was an empty chair, hearing the gospel, coming to faith in Jesus. You need to visualize that and you need to have faith that that can come about. If you've never seen it in your mind, then, 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 then maybe you're not praying that enough. You need to see your one coming to Jesus, uh, having faith and the Lord saving them and, and just really radically changing their life. And so we, we want you to have that passion. Now, here's the thing. Do they have to be at one church? Absolutely not. They just need to be in a life-giving church somewhere, right? It's about the kingdom. So it's not always about one church by any stretch. It's just the fact that they're going somewhere. They're getting connected to a life-giving church, right? But we know what we're trying to do here. And so I want you to understand this. We celebrate when a person puts their faith in Jesus, but we need a plan to disciple them so they continue to grow in their faith. And, and I would just say that we have discovered in the last probably 20 years in the North American church that we're really great at giving people a salvation experience, but we're terrible at discipling people. Uh, and now the church has really started turning that around. And I'm super excited about that because I feel like the church at large is really once again discovering the importance of discipleship. Yes, coming to Jesus is such an important moment, but continuing to grow is vital. Second Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. Is it really a salvation if a person professes faith in Jesus but is not following him six months later? It might have been an experience. I don't know. Nobody can judge exactly what went on between that person and the Lord. But the reality is, is, that, is that we're going to know how good our confession of faith is by the fruit that we produce. And so we have to help people. So it, so many times we think, well, I got, I helped get them across the line of salvation and truly all of heaven celebrates. And we do, we all do because what, and what joy, right? But just as important as that is, is that they need to be befriended. They need to be encouraged. They need to be taught and they need to be brought into connection with a small group of believers. That's why we, we promote life group participation so much. And, and ultimately, our goal is we would love for everyone to lead a group, right? We, we, would, we would love for you to be in a group for, for a good season of time, to, to be discipled yourself, right? Uh, we want you to be trained and then start co-leading uh, with another group. And then at some point, start your own group and, and start it at your workplace. 
It doesn't have to be like a, a, a Monday night or something. Start it wherever. And, and there's a process for all of that. And so I, I want to take a little bit of time right now, though. And I want to, I, I want to share some stories because I, I love stories, right? Um, how many love movies, right? How many like, like when the movie starts, you just like, and the popcorn and you're like drawn in. I, I love that. And we all love stories, but I really love true stories. I love stories of what Jesus has done in the lives of people. So I've asked several people and they're going to come up and they're going to share their stories with me. And they're very brave. And so when they come up, uh, I want you to give them a big hand clap because think how nervous you might be uh, coming up on this stage today. But they're awesome. And they said that they would do it. So Jose, would you come up? I I want Jose to come up. Let's give Jose a hand. Uh, buddy. So here, here's the thing. Um, I promised them, thank you, thank you. I promised them that I would go really short in my sermon and I didn't. Um, but it's okay because it's spring break. Uh, y'all got time. Don't be acting like you got to go anywhere. It's still good. Okay, so Jose. So the Lord obviously has done a great work in your life and everything. So yeah. let, let's take a couple of moments. Let's kind of just start. See, like, um, so what was your life like before Jesus? Mm-hmm. And then what was, what happened, what, what happened when Jesus came in your life? What was that experience life? And that, what was your life like after Jesus? So um, first off, I want to give the glory to God just Amen. for this moment, right? Yeah. So before I encountered Jesus, I was just living a bad life, you know, like everybody, right? I was, had a bad childhood. I was molested. I was uh, uh, addicted to drugs. I was um, Mm. just in in anger because of it, you know? So it was just kind of an effect that went throughout my life and and carried over to my marriage and Mm. all those things. You know, it's one of those effects when you're bad, you're just, Mm. just bad. Yeah, but it wasn't until about two or three years later, when we came back to church and my wife got pregnant with my youngest son, and we got some bad news on the on the ultrasound. And uh, uh, I, it reminds me of the song "I Trust in God" because I sought the Lord, He heard and He answered. Come on, and um, I did that. I fasted. I prayed. I got close to God, and he answered. You know, it was one of those things where I promised myself to sacrifice my old me and just put it down. Mm. If, not if, but I knew, I say, I told God, I know you could do this, but at the same time, I'm going to do my part. You know, I sacrificed the right. old me. Right. Perfect, I'm not, never going to be. But... Um, I told him that, and he answered me. It was in that moment when my wife came back from the from the post diagnostics or the ultrasound, the next one, and she came in like nothing. I was in my my living room just praying and and you know listening to to worship music. She came in like nothing, and and um, you know I knew at the time I had encountered the Holy Spirit. And my house just felt so amazing, you know. I knew everything was going to be okay, but I had to hear it from my wife, right, of course, because she was with the one at the doctor. And, um, yeah, everything was good. And I was just, from that moment, I was like, God, it's, it's you. Yeah. From now on. Yeah. And I encountered the Holy Spirit, and, and now I just, everything that I used to do, it's no more. It's it's Jesus. And, All right. and what I need to do. And, uh I just wanted to share scripture because it's been in my heart and my That's mind great. and my heart. That's so and good. And my brother Jacob, I don't think he's here. Uh, uh, so it's revelations. We're overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So yeah. big. That, and I think that so ex- speaks that's to so me exactly good. what this moment is. It's right on. And I really appreciate the moment because... I, I got as soon as PK told me about this, I was just like, man, the holy the Holy Spirit just started moving in me. I was like, 
We're gonna share every single detail. And he said two minutes. I'm like, PK, it's not gonna be two minutes. It's just like, it's, I mean, I want to, but it's, it's just like, but uh, that was me before and that was after. And so good. Jesus has just been so good. I mean, on, if you could, I know it sounds cliche, but if you could do it for me, you could do it for anybody. I Come was on, that's bad, right. Yo. Amen. Like, Amen. I was bad. And, uh, so let, let me ask you this, though. And I, I appreciate you. you know, that takes a lot of, I mean, you know, just, just opening a tiny window. And even you, you guys know when we do that or when yeah. people share a little bit, when we share a little, we all know there's so much more, right? Yeah. That like yeah. one sentence, but it could be a lifetime of pain, right? I mean, yeah. so yeah. I appreciate that. So what I want to talk about now, so you have that experience, right? With Jesus mm-hmm. and what you were before, because there was a lot of deep-seated things. Right. So I, I know you're part of, a, in fact, you're part of the, the Wednesday Night Life group that I'm a part of. Yep. Um, Tell me how that's helped you um, grow your faith, may, maybe processing some of the things that Jesus has called us to do and obey. How's, how's that helped you in your life? Uh, man, life groups has been so dear to my heart. I mean, it's, I just can't, I can't put it into simple words, but you read Matthew and that was also in my heart. And mm. it's just discipleship and, and the members. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a shout out to the, to the guys. Yeah, yeah. Jacob, Daniel, leaders of the group, amazing people. It's just no better leaders. Aaron, Gilbert, Eddie, uh, Jason, Juan, both Derek's, yep. and um, I know I'm forgetting somebody, but that, that, Oscar, Oscar and PK. Oscar, there you go. Uh, Whew, man, we share stories, testimonies. We get vulnerable. Like, we get to the point where it doesn't matter what we say because we're in a group where just, we're just feeding each other the word of Christ and where we are just dwelling in that. And, and, and it, it, we're not afraid. Yeah. We're, not, we're not prideful to, to, to um, share our stories because we're learning from them. And... and we're overcoming those. Yeah. All these people that are in that group, I've seen so much growth in them, and, and right. it's it's just yeah. amazing what right. Christ is doing. Yeah, we we speak encouragement and just life into each other daily. Yeah. Scripture, it's so good. It's amazing. It's, it's so it's, good. It's awesome. So let me ask you one more quick question. Uh, maybe maybe another. But uh, so who are you sharing Jesus with? So me and my wife, we talk about it all the time. So we're sharing Jesus almost every day. Sometimes we disagree on some things, but uh, at work, people that, I, that I'm close to, uh, it's kind of funny that you say it, because yesterday we were at Costco and there was a man with a shirt that said, freedom, chain breaker on the back. And I was like, man, you're a, you're a Christ follower. And it's like the entrance of Costco. And we just started talking about God, you know, what they've been, you know, what God's been doing in, in our lives. And this guy was amazing. And mm. I was just like, man, like, I want to learn from you. So I got his number and just, mm. you know, random people like that. Yeah. If you get the opportunity, right? Well, not if you get, you should have the opportunity because those moments are there. You That's just right. have to be That's mindful right. and in the spirit of them. Just, just That's right. take the chance. Some it people, is. all they need sometimes is just to hear it from a person like you and, and, just, just, and really, it's our story, on them. right? Yeah. Because people can they can debate doctrine, right? But they can never debate your story about yeah. what Jesus has done in your life, right? Yeah. Because you know that better than anybody else, right? right. So, so what are you doing? Are, where are you serving? So right now, uh, I'm doing kids ministry. I'm helping in the infant room with my kid because he's he's bad, and I just have <laughs> I have to monitor. Uh, I do camera work sometimes, and. Uh, Sometimes I help outside. <laughs> I help outside with the uh, with the flags when I yeah. when they need me to. That's kind of like part time, but that's so uh, awesome. That's well, me. listen, hey, thank oh, and, and check in, check in. Shout out to the check in. Yeah, shout out to the check in. Talk about kids, men, check in. So, hey, let's give Jose a, a, a hand. He did so good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I appreciate that, uh, Miss Sandra. Why don't you come up? Let's give Sandra a hand. This takes a lot of, takes a lot of guts to do. And so when I said stage, she said, let me at it. Um, actually, that's not what she said. Um, so, so let's just talk real quick. It's just like, so your life before Jesus, 
My life before Jesus was very dysfunctional. Very, very dysfunctional. Very, okay. It, I wasn't afraid of sin. Mm. I didn't care if I sinned. Mm. Um, it's just very dysfunctional, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. Well, and but that's pretty common, right? Yeah. When when, when we don't know Jesus, it's yeah. just like we we do what's right in our own eyes. That's yeah. what the Bible says, right? So a lot of pain, a lot of confusion, along with sin, though, right? Yeah. Sin always brings that, right? So what was it? Can can you point to a moment where you really had an experience with Jesus? What was that like? When I had an experience with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hold that mic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be awesome. You are awesome. So, so uh, yeah, what was it like? Uh, can, you, can you think of any moment where you knew Jesus was really working in your life? Uh, Maybe there's many of them. In life group. Oh, we life used to group. go to Friday life group at okay. Jessica's house. Okay, come on. <laughs> and I had prayed for God to give me a sign that my husband was going to be my husband. Okay. That if we were together for 18 years before yeah. we got married. That's a pretty big prayer. And I asked them, because I wanted... For us to have the same faith, for him to go to church with me, because he would go with his mom. Got you. And um, I wanted somebody to experience that that faithfulness with me. Yeah, yeah. And um, I yeah. asked God, I was like, if he's not for me, I don't care. I'll walk away. After 18 years, I don't care. I'll walk. Mm. I just need somebody that's going to share the same faith as me. Yeah. That's and, having a real passion for the yeah. Lord. And he answered my prayer because he, couple, he got COVID, he got really sick, and then we were in the truck, and he was like... You know what? I want to marry you. Ooh, wow. Let's get married. Aaron. Aaron's like. So I was like, really? About time. Aaron's like. I, <laughs> he's like, I got to get right or get left, right? So. <laughs> so and Jesus so, answered my prayer. And so, we got married. So after. Because y'all got married in church. Here, your church. Come on, y'all. <laughs> right here, they got married. So, the day we got married was the first day that he met you. Yeah. The very first time he came to church was the wow. day he got married. I thought we'd, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a trip, y'all. <laughs> you meet the pastor for the first time, then you get married, right? And you're saying, I do. So, uh, but, so your life after Jesus, what's my that life been after like? after Jesus, yeah. my sister, first of all, is the one who encouraged me to come to church. And your sister is? Brenda. Okay. Yes. <laughs> And I thank God for her every day because she's guided me and lead it and led me to Jesus. Wow, come on. That's so, so good. By me being here at church, I got this hunger to to yeah. to know God. Yes. By reading, by worshiping, by going to life groups. Mm. It's it it gave me more of a hunger to know him more. Yes, yeah, so good. So it, you mentioned uh, the Friday night group. Yes. Uh, Jessica's group and uh, Veronica's group. So t tell me more about life groups in general, how those have helped you. It's more like a family away from my OC family here at mm -hmm, church. Mm -hmm. It's just like a smaller family for yeah. me. And it's more encouraging because they share more of the word of God with yeah, you. Yeah. And it's more, it's like more on a, how can I say it? Personal. Of a personal. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. So would you say that you grew more in life I groups have grown as more. a result of yes. okay so it's kind of like been an accelerant yes, in, your, I think in your spiritual faith. It's helped me grow more because me and my husband's relationship has flourished ever since then. So I good. think ever since we started so coming to church. Well, we have to get Aaron up right yeah. after you. So it's but, flourished because even our kids see it. They're like, okay. "Oh my god, y'all I, I see the change in y'all. So actually your influence now, your, your children, yes. all your family, everybody else, and y'all have a big family. Yes, a yeah. family of eight. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> and four grandbabies. And four grandbabies. That's a lot happening. Yes. There's a lot going on right there. So who are you sharing Jesus with? I share Jesus, I plant seeds yeah, yeah. at work okay. with my boss, Yeah. Um, with my coworkers. I have this one patient that I love dearly. And um, she has a she goes to a life group. Okay. And she, we always talk about Jesus, and she comes oh, once a week, and good. she always tells me, "How's your life group?" Oh, that's so good. So whoever I can share God with, yeah. I share. Yeah, because you really him. never know. Yes. You never know when that's going to strike. You know, when somebody's heart's really open in that moment. So it's just yeah. that willingness to do yes. that, right? That's so good. Everybody, give Sandra a hand. She did so good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Here we go. All right, Aaron, we, you have to follow your, your wife after that. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I was going to like help. 
this guy right here, he, he's, a, he's a good dude, and I, I appreciate him so much. So what was your life like before Jesus? Oh, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, that's, that is perfect. Uh, I'm nervous, everybody, so. That's all right. Uh, I guess it started a long time ago when I was young. went to my parents again when I was nine years old, watched them get beat up by police while my mom was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, that was my starting point from being in gangs, uh, drive-bys, being shot at, became an alcoholic, uh, around drugs, of course, and all the way to, well, I drank so much that when I was probably 19 years old, I pretty much died, dropped dead from alcohol, had my stomach pumped and everything. Uh, wow. Age What's 24, going on? liver, bad liver, bleeding, used the restroom, bleed. My liver was bad already. Mm. And of course, I was a bad temper, wanted to fight the world. Mm. Yeah, I was better than everybody, so. Yeah. And, man, I just, I can go on forever. I just. Yeah. There, there's on. a lot, right? There's yes. a lot that, that really, and yeah. Just mad at everything. But, you, so. you know, you talked about, and this is really, I think, so important uh, because, you know, things happen to us mm -hmm. that we don't have the emotional capacity to process. Mm -hmm. And so we just let them, they just kind of, they just kind of destroy us from the inside out, right? Yes. And, and so they start a process. Yeah. Uh, of behavior in our life. And that happens to just a, a lot of people, right? Yeah. So I, that's one of the things of coming to Jesus is that he just doesn't save us, but he also helps address the cause of our pain, right? Because he wants to have a, a blessed life in this life now, but also in the one to come. But he also wants to give us a, an abundant life even right now. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like with Jesus when you, when you, when you met him? Uh, and, and there's probably several, but, it, but what, what's the one that really it, might stand out to you? several moments and... I think when it started, my freedom class. Oh, the freedom and, class, and okay. I'll, so good. I'll always tell everyone, my, my freedom class, I mean, it was, I always I tell them, they're my foundation. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's where it started at. Yeah. And then uh, I was still wanting more, mm -hmm. and that man camp. Yeah. When I went to a man camp last year, oh, man, it was something that, it was way, way different, and I remember I came back to work, and I just felt something, and never, I didn't tell my wife or anyone, and I went to the restroom, I just broke down. I just felt something, and texted everyone, texted my kids, told them I love them, my brothers, and I apologize to everyone I can think of, wow. and whatever people's number I have for everything I did bad to them. Come on. And I, I mean, probably hundreds of people I did so much bad to. Yeah, yeah. And I wish I could, I mean, go back and tell right. them all I'm sorry yeah. right. for everything I did wrong to them. Right. Yeah. Which is really fruit of a, of a great confession of surrendering your life to Jesus. And now you, you see the fruit of change, right? Yes. Uh, and, and even in your heart, even now. Because it, it, it's hard to picture Aaron that way, but I bet you were, a, you, I bet you were a beep on wheels, right? I bet there was a lot going on in your life oh, or absolutely. you were hard to deal with, just yeah. listening and reading between the lines. But now... I, I just feel like you're, to me, you're one of the easiest going guys and you got a, you got a lot of love in your heart towards people uh, and you love Jesus with all of your heart uh, and you'll do whatever. Um, so let me ask you this. What has your life been like? I've already heard a little bit, but uh, after Jesus now, because I remember now, you know, you getting married oh, yes, right, yes. right up here, right after I, service. That was so yes, cool. Yes. I, I, I didn't, when my wife told me, hey, let's get married. I like well, whenever I told her, let's get married, she's like, okay, we're just going to go to courthouse. That's it. Yeah. I said, we're just going to courthouse. And then she's like, oh, I want my pastor to marry me. I'm like, no. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, all right. I'm like, okay. I said, we'll do that. Then she's like, after church, I said, okay. And after church meant during, you know, church, I like, which it was great because I, I love my wife. It was great. Got to see her. Yeah. Uh, my father walk her down and yeah. not knowing at that moment my family was going to grow which was my OC family now Yeah, and yeah. I love yeah. everyone I love everyone yeah. so, new brothers and sisters I have now Yeah. so man it's, our marriage has like she said has skyrocketed up there and I'm loving it that's so good <laughs> um, 
And so we just had a real a short man camp not too long ago. Uh, actually, what, two weeks ago? Yes. Was it last well, last week? weekend. Last week. Uh, and I, what, was that all your boys there? Yes, my three boys. Yeah. That was my first time, us three being together. A long time. And Thank you. There's some fine young men. Thank you. I, yeah. I, lo I love my boys, and yeah. I wish I could spend more time with them. Yeah. And I got, yeah. I mean, two so, so here's the thing, though. Your legacy, look how radically different it's changed. Yeah. What you were giving Amen. versus now what you're giving them and all of your yeah. children and everybody in your life. So yeah. you, because of your, your interaction with Jesus, things have changed. So, and I, I just want you to know how proud of you we are by allowing the Lord to change you, uh, but also too, just seeing you in life group, growing as a follower of Jesus, yeah. uh, putting the commands of Christ to work in your life. And, and you're just, you're, you're a perfect example of what happens in someone's life when they fully submit to Jesus. And I just yeah. want you to know how grateful we are. Uh, I'm grateful to Jesus for what he's done in your life, but oh, yeah. I'm grateful yeah. to you for allowing him yeah. uh, to work in your life. And so when I see you and Sandra, and I see your children, and I see your, your kids and all of that, and your grandkids, what they could have gotten versus what they're getting now, I just thank God uh, for that because it's I, so good. I just... I always told my, I was so, I told my wife, you know, the day when the Lord calls me, I want them to remember, remember me for who I became, who I am, yes. not for my past. Come on, isn't that true of all of us? Yes. Isn't that what we all want? We don't want people to remember who we were before, but who we are now. Yes. So, hey, let's give Aaron a hand. He did a fabulous job. Thank you, thank you so much. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Hey, Miss Rose, why don't you come up right quick? Let's give Miss Rose a hand. Awesome. There we go. Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Let's just pretend no one's out there. Nobody's out. It's just you and I talking on the stage. Okay. You get to hold the mic. But you don't have to sing, all right? So... <laughs> Um, so, just kind of what I've been asking everybody else. So, what was your life like before Jesus? Um, well, I feel like I don't have a story. You know, you said those that don't have a story. And I really feel like I don't. Um, when I was young, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Mm. Um, in fact, my mom didn't go to church. Mm. But uh, I was married very young, uh, and my husband was older. And we raised our kids as Catholics. Mm -hmm. Hardcore. If you know, you know. Um, and so, like, reading the Bible, and mm -hmm. we just didn't do that. And I have tons of regret now for not raising my children in a Christian mm -hmm. home. But um, uh, we were married over 32 years. And he got diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. And you and Pastor Angie just helped me through the most difficult time. Mm -hmm. And he got to know the Lord and got saved yeah. before he passed away. Come on, isn't that great? Yes. And, uh, you know, and I thank God. I thank God for the family that we have. We have a large family yeah. uh, that are here with me now. Um, and so now my thirst for the Lord after he passed away, I was just so lonely. And I, you know, mm. I'm dealing with depression, anxiety, panic attacks. Mm. And it was very difficult. And for the longest, Pastor Angie was just like, you know, come join this life group. You know, like, I'm like, OK, I'll be there and, you know, make an excuse up and just didn't go for you. And that was been since 2018. Mm. So, you know, she never gave up on me. She would call, yeah. text. Yeah. Um, and my thirst, like, I wanted to know the Lord. I wanted to know him so I could teach my grandchildren yeah. and be able to show them, let him know his love, yeah. his grace. And um, so she didn't give up on me, but I was still one of those, you know, lukewarm Christians. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get to know the Lord, but I didn't mm -hmm. want to stop with my sin and still, you know, doing right. those things. So it was very difficult for me. But I know I wanted to be a better person for my family. Right. Um, and so, you know, we were going to church, followed you guys, and um, came here, and I was like, you know what? I was praying and praying. I'm like, God, please, you know, get me through this. I felt so lonely. Mm. I felt alone. And, you know, everybody was like, you know, God's with you. And I'm like, well, where is he? Yeah. You know? All right. I'm like, I want to I hear him. You know, it was at a life group, and somebody's like, I want to hear God talk to me. I'm like, so do I. Like, yeah. am I not listening? Or like, what is it? Yeah. Like, when is he going to yeah. talk to me? And, you know, if it wasn't for 
Pastor Angie and Jessica De Los Santos mm. that have been my strength. Like they are just. And they're your my, life group leaders. In so. my life group, yes. That was my first life group. I started attending. <laughs> Yay. Good job. Yes, but you know, even you know, back in 2018, 2019, you know, Jessica and, uh, and Pastor Angie would always pray for me mm -hmm. and praying for my family, mm -hmm. and I was like, they just inspired me, you know, to mm -hmm. want to be a better person, want to have a better walk with God. Yes, I want yes. to know Jesus. I yes. want to feel Him, and um, yeah. So since then, so I did my first life group, and then the women's retreat came up, and. Francine was like, Rose, you're going to go? I'm like, yeah, I'll go. She's like, I'll go if you go. I'm like, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and so then, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to go. Paid for it. And then the day before, I was at home, and I told my daughter, mm, I don't think I'm going to go. So she's like, Mom, you need to go. Yeah, go. That's I'm good. Like, oh, okay. Uh, and it was just the most amazing, amazing thing. You know, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I got healed. No more depression, no more anxiety. That's so good. That's yes, so good. Yes. Oh, my God. That's and, so good. And if it wasn't for the women, women yeah. empowering women, inspiring them, like yeah. praying for you, lifting you up in the word, yeah. it's just the most amazing feeling. That's right. And I got, I'm got. i in two life groups now. Come on yeah. now. Awesome. <laughs> Jessica Miller and Veronica. Yeah. Yeah, but now, you know, and what's helped me is like, I didn't know how to read the Bible. I couldn't mm -hmm. understand it. I would read it, and I'm mm -hmm. like, what am I reading? Mm -hmm. uh, I do now my acts praying. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I have a plan, and I read. I have a better understanding. So good. That I can have a conversation now with my grandkids, and they ask me a question. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. And That's so good. So, yeah, so now my life is just totally changed with one church, and it's definitely what you say, you know. Mm -hmm. Changing lives one person at a time because my is. life is totally changed. And, and even, you know, I mean, because you have great grandkids. I mean, 16. Awesome. 16. Come on, y'all. <laughs> well, I got one and almost two. So. But, you know, um, I mean, that next generation needs to know. Yes. They need to yes. know who Jesus is. Yes. And I can't think of anybody better than grandparents, certainly parents, mm -hmm. but also aunts, uncles. I mean, we all owe it to those little ones. Uh, and sometimes they're not so little as, as they're growing up, but just to know about Jesus. And yes. because their life gets hard, their yeah. life gets challenging. And so many times we're thinking, who am I going to share Jesus? Uh, surely it's a, it's, it's a neighbor. And maybe mm -hmm. that is true. Maybe it's a coworker, mm -hmm. but you know, many times it's right there in our home, yes. right there in our family yeah. that, that we can have these great conversations with people who who may or may not know the Lord yet. Yes, so, but, yes. but I'm so proud of you, and I just want you to know that for just allowing the Lord to to, to work on your life and yes. and just start growing you, right? Yes. Because uh, yes. at some point down the line, you you'll be leading a life group, and you're going to be witnessing <laughs> and you're going to be sharing uh, <laughs> uh, to people uh, about the Lord, uh, and you're going to be discipling. You're going to be you're going to be helping them as well. Yes, and we have a is, process that for that. Goal. That is so. My goal. Let's give her a hand. I, I appreciate that so much. <laughs> And uh, I think I've got one, one more. Where is Ruby? Try to give Ruby a hand. Come on up, Ruby. Hey, is this okay? I know we're taking a, a couple of, is this all right? That's awesome, because that's what we're going to do. That's it. Come on up, girl. How are you doing? I'm good, thank I'm you. I'm so glad you made it. Thank you. Glad that you're here today. To here. Well, we're glad you're here. So here's the thing. Let, I've kind of been asking the same question. So what, what's your life like before Jesus? What was going on? What were you battling? What was um, going on in your life? So a year ago this month, I was going through, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going through a really tough spiritual battle. I was being attacked by the enemy. So it, it started off really weird. Like I started just feeling kind of dizzy, sick depressed and I didn't know what was going on because I'm a really pretty active person. So um, literally from one day to the next, I, I was sitting in my toilet and I started just hearing like voices in my head. So I was like, what Gosh. is this? What is going on? This is not normal. This is not godly. So I battled that for five months straight. And it was really, really hard because I held on to the very little faith that I had left in me to know that I was gonna, like, I didn't know, like, I was that I was gonna get over, like, out of it. I, I did wanna, you know, it just came to a point where one time I was, um, 
my kids were at school and and I had my little one with me and I said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm done with my life. Like before I even touch a hair on my kid's head, I would rather I would rather take my life away before I touch a hair on my kid's head. So yeah, my kids were at school and I had my little one, I gave him his bottle, I laid him down. And I'm, I sat on the couch and I'm just like rocking like myself back and forth. And I called my mom and I told my mom, I, in my mind I already knew like, this is it. This is it for me, like I'm done. So in my mind I already knew like, um, I called my mom and I was like, mom, I love you. And I was just crying and she was, she already knew what was going on because she, I had already told her obviously, it had been a battle for five months. And I told my mom, I love you. And she was like, what's going on? Are you okay? And I was just crying and she was like, don't give up. And I told her, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. And she was like, don't give up. Because whenever you're going to get out of it, that's when they'll start attacking you even more and more and more. She, and then she started, she started praying for me. And um, the whole, like, I, I had so many bad panic attacks throughout the whole entire five months that I, um, that I battled it. My first panic attack sent me to the hospital. My heart rate was like 180. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was so bad. And they did EKGs. They told me, all your EKGs are normal. We don't know what's going on. So I got sent home. Second, second panic attack lasted over four hours. Mm. And I was on the phone with my sister Veronica. For those of you who know Veronica, like she, she's my sister. So I was on the phone with my sister Veronica, and I was like, pray for me. And she, as the minute she started praying, I blacked out. Mm. I could not hear a word she said. I did not, I, I didn't hear anything she said. And when I kind of like snapped back, I was like, Veronica, did you pray? She was like, yeah, I'm, I'm done praying. And I was like, I didn't hear anything you said. So it was almost like the enemy was blocking me mm. from from hearing so the word of God. How, how would you say, what was the definitive breakthrough for you? What happened? I mean, how, how did the um, Lord really minister in your life to, to get you out of that? Because it sounds like terrible. It, it was horrible. And anxiety so, and, and even suicidal. To be honest with you, it was December 3rd. Um, okay. Worship was playing and you came up here to the stage and you said, um, that, that you said, I've never done this before and um, I'm surprised at what I'm about to do, but I feel like the Holy Spirit is asking me to do this. And you said, when I count to three, all the things that you've been holding on to, that wow. you, yeah, all the things that you've been holding on to that you didn't think I could do for you in your life, I want you to let it go on the count of three. Yeah. It was that day that my life changed Come forever. On. Well, praise yeah. God. That's so, so good. I, yeah. That's so good. And that, you know, it's amazing. Many times, I mean, things are processed, right? Right. And, and definitely there's times we definitely need counseling and help and things. But yeah, I, and I, I, yeah. I, I did. I went to different doctors and I kind of just told them what was going on and said, oh, you're depressed or you're stressed out or you're going through anxiety. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what, like, I don't, like, it's, it's different when you're going through it than whenever doctors say, oh, here, you need to take these medicines. Um, yeah. They put me on Zoloft and like Xanax for anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. The minute that I took those medicines at the pharmacy, I threw them in the trash. Because mm. I said, this is not the medicine I need. The only medicine I need is I need to find God. I need to look for God. Okay. That's the only medicine and I need. And so the Lord did work on your behalf. That's, yeah. that's awesome. So how, how did, how did um, now did you get to go to the women's retreat? I did. You did. Yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. What did you get from that? What did the Lord do? It was for you? amazing. I um, I went up there and whenever Pastor Andrew said, "Does anybody have a testimony to give?" and I was just like, "Ooh, like I don't want to do it." Like it was just kind of like something holding me back. I was like, "You know, you know what? This is the enemy just trying to hold me back from not giving my testimony, but I'm gonna yeah. do it." So yeah. I went up there and oh my God, did I meet so many amazing women? One of them being Miss Sandra. Um, I gave my testimony as soon as I, as I sat down, she tapped me, she was like, I have something to give you. Mm. And she gave me this little jar that had a mustard seed in it. And she told me that she had a similar situation with her daughter mm. and um, she gave me the mustard seed and she told me, I know you've been holding on to faith as small as a mustard seed. And I have faith, with, like for me, I, I didn't have any faith in me anymore. And right. I turned my faith to God, and I was like, oh, like, 
Yeah. If you're real, like, save me out of this, like, get me out of this situation. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, like, I held on to faith uh, by a thin thread and I didn't let go. Wow. I was like, I'm, I'm going to hold on wow. for as long as I have to, but wow. I'm going to. That's so good. Get through this. And it's just amazing what the Lord can do, especially when we surrender our lives to Him it fully. Is. And I know, too, even that a lot of times you come to that group over the, uh, with, uh, uh, you've come before a couple of times to Angie's group, right? Haven't you? You've come yeah, a so times. Um, to like. But I know sometimes, too, yeah, you, um, you can't because yeah, of your I schedule. Yeah, I went to like group once, yeah. but, you know, my, schedule, my work schedule is always off, so yeah. I'm yeah. not able to, like, keep up with going to life groups, but... Yeah. Yeah, Pastor Andrew, she's amazing. She will text me every day to check on me. And it feels great to know that someone is there and they're yeah. they're thinking about you and they're caring about you and they're praying for you. Sandra, every day since retreat, she'll send me worship songs early in the morning and it helps me get through my day. Yeah. And um, So she we need each me. other. Yeah. We need each other. Yeah. Well, Ruby, I'm here to tell you that the things that you see the Lord doing, it's just the it's just the first taste. Uh, because there's even more coming. There's there's mm-hmm. more good. The things that you're desiring in your spirit and you're wanting in your heart, they're coming. Um, the right relationships, the right things that you want for your kids, they're coming. Uh, and so just by staying steady, by staying committed to Jesus, even when it's not convenient and even when it's hard, because you guys, this girl, she drives from Cleveland, Texas to come to church. Yeah. Um, I drive an hour. So, and you've got uh, three, three kids. What is it? Three kids. Three kids, yeah. And she has kids. three kids to get ready. Single mama. Wow. So let me say one thing. Before I started coming to church, um, it was Sunday morning. My mom, she showed up at my house at 8. I'm like, what are you doing here? And she said, you're going to church. I was already battling my spiritual battle. And I was like, I'm going to church. She said, yeah, you're going to church. Get ready. So I'm like, okay, whatever, I guess. So she drove. I couldn't drive because it just got to a point where I couldn't drive. I couldn't. I couldn't shower, I couldn't eat, I didn't mm-hmm. feed my kids. I kind of just like, yeah. you know, felt Prof- like my kids. Depression. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, she drove an hour to pick me up, an hour back to church, an hour to drop me off, and an hour back to her house. So she yeah. drove a total of four hours, but she brought me to church. Yeah. And the day that I, the first day that I got to church, I sat in the very back corner over there. Mm. And the minute I stepped foot into church, I wanted to run out of here. Mm. I said, what is this? Like, this is yeah, just is not this? for me. Yeah. What is so, this? What is up in this place? Yeah, right? so, but it wasn't me, you know, it was just like. That's right. Be, and my sister, Veronica, she looked at me, and I'm like looking at her, and she was like, mm-mm. <laughs> and she held my hand, she's like, you're not going nowhere. Yeah. And I'm, I've, been, I've been coming here since then. Yeah. And you're not going anywhere. Thank you. Hey, let, I, I appreciate her so much. That takes a lot of courage. Thank you for coming up. Let me walk you down right there. So we have more stories, but we're going we're gonna to put those off for another day. And actually, we're going to do this again because I want to get some of our young adults up here. I want to get some of our students up here. I want them to share our stories and everything as well. And uh, it looks like the uh, motion sensors just came on. Uh, you got to love the gym but, uh, or the stage. But my, my point in, in saying all this is that what I want you to see is, is that it's not hard and the needs are everywhere. And, and they're, they're people that are all around us. And so you may see an empty chair, but the Lord already has a plan. And so what he's lacking and what he needs is your hands, your feet, your voice to do that. Come on, would you bow your head with me? And let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for just, uh, just reminding us once again what our mission is. Thank you, Lord, for just speaking to one church, Lord, and just uh, speaking to our hearts and into our minds and reminding us, God, that you're calling us, Lord, you're equipping us, God. You're the one who wants to do work through us. So I pray, God, and I thank you for all of our life group leaders. I thank you for every single person at OC who's sharing Jesus with others. God, help us to stay focused on that mission of, of just sharing Jesus and growing people up in Jesus. Lord, help me not to think that it's someone else's responsibility, but it's my task you've given me. And, I, and it's not an obligation but it's something I want to do out of joy because I know what you've done for me. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, this is a, a wonderful moment to do that. Come on, would you just, if, if that's you, if maybe maybe you heard Ruby talking or maybe Aaron or somebody up here talking, like that's, that's exactly what I need. Then the way you do this is by putting your faith in Jesus. It's the first step in a wonderful journey. So if that's you, would you pray this with me? Dear Jesus, I need you. I surrender my life to you. I confess my mistakes and my failures 
and my sin. I trust you, Jesus, to save me. I believe you're the Son of God and that you gave up everything for me. Show me how to live for you. Show me how to be your disciple. And with every eye still closed and every head still bowed, if you prayed this prayer, would you mind just slipping your hand up because we want to put something in your hand right now. We want to give you something. So just slip your hand up right there in the middle. Anybody else right there? Awesome. Okay, we're putting something in your hand here in just a moment. Amen. And everyone said amen. So uh, if you pray that prayer, just fill out that salvation card. Take it to guest services. We have a new beginner's Bible for you and some other material for your faith to grow deep and strong. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate that, everybody. It's what it's all about. It's what we're talking about. Just like that. Just like that. Amen. So you received that word today? Going to put it to work? All right. God bless you.